All right, so welcome back to another lab session for learning uh, ROS. And so in today's uh, lab session video, I'm going to quickly show you um, the demonstration of uh, two concepts that we covered in our previous lecture. So first is how do we use ROS services, where we will see an example uh, following from our lecture uh, to look at uh, both the ROS server and ROS client APIs in, in Python. And then following that, I will also show you some um, uh, demos for uh, using launch files, which is also something that we covered in the, in the lecture last week. So, so let's jump right into it and uh, get started by looking at ROS services. So I already have my VM launched and I'm going to go ahead and start ROS core. Uh, I'm going to show you the demonstration first, and then we will uh, go through you know, how it works and look at the code as we have been doing in the previous lab sessions as well. So feel free to follow along, pause uh, if you must to uh, you know, keep up to speed. All right, so, so uh, we are not using any new packages. We are building on the same configuration that we've been using for all the previous lab sessions. So you should already have your beginner tutorial package that you have pulled from the course Git repository and copied it into your um, beginner tutorial source subdirectory in the Catkin workspace. I'm not going to go through all of that again because we've already covered it uh, several times. So let's look at you know how the services are started and how do we use a ROS service. So first I'm going to go ahead and launch uh, one of the nodes which will start the server. So we will say, ROS run and the name of the package is beginner tutorial and we have a node called add two integers uh, and the node I'm launching first is server.python. Okay, so this will launch a server in the background and you see some um, messages being echoed to the shell where the server says it's ready to add two integers. And uh, just so that you know what is going on underneath the hood, um, if I say, you know, ROS topic list, we won't have any new topics visible, right? So uh, remember how services and clients, they don't use this publisher subscriber model. It's a different architecture where a request is sent to the server from the client and then the server responds with a, a response to that request. So instead, if I say ROS service list, uh, we should see that there's several servers uh, or services which exist in the system. So I just want to make that quick distinction between uh, topics and services. Uh, and though you have a uh, add to integer server, um, which has some logging uh, kind of nodes which are present or services which are present. And then this is our main service, which is called add to integers. And we'll see in the code uh, what this service does. So just a quick distinction before we jump into the client side. So we have our ROS core running, we have our server running up here. Uh, so let's interact with the server. So I'm going to say uh, ROS run beginner tutorials, and this time add two integers, and I'm going to invoke client.python. Um, I already know that client.python re requires as input uh, two numbers that will be added as the name kind of implies. But let's see what happens if I just you know try to run this node. Uh, so it will echo that the correct usage of this uh, uh, this script or this client request needs to include these two arguments x and y, which is why it, you know it didn't really do anything. It didn't send a request to the server as of now. So what we can do is we can rerun the same command, but let's just give it some random numbers. So I can say uh, why don't you add one, two, three, four, and uh, five, six, seven, eight. Those are my two arguments, and I want to use the client to compute the sum of these two numbers. And so this time, when I run it, you can see it requested uh, that these two numbers, the input arguments, should be added. And this request was sent to the server where it did its thing and said, I'm returning the sum of these two numbers, which is 6,912. Uh, and then this result was also displayed on the client side. Um, and so all of this happened using this service that is running in the background called add to integers. And uh, this is what essentially the 
the server client way of interaction between different nodes uh, looks like, right? So you have a node, which is a server, it's running a service, we'll look at the ROS Python API in just a second. And then as long as the server is running or the service is available, um, the, uh, the client can interact with that service by um, sending the correct arguments which are specified in the service itself and then uh, it will receive a response if everything is in the correct syntax and respects all the service definitions. All right, so it's a pretty straightforward demo, but I think it'll help to clarify how it all works. Um, so before we see how it all works, let me show you where things are located. So I'll just uh, maybe quickly, uh, well, you can use the same window as the, as the client because it's not active. Um, so if you say ROS CD, and you go to beginner tutorial and you go to scripts. Uh, over there you will see uh, inside this folder, this is where our previous nodes were also, um, um, you know, reside. The listener and the publisher and subscriber and the talker and remember how we did the random number stuff. Uh, but here you can see there are two nodes. One of them is called a server and the other is called client. Uh, and that's why when we were running them, we were using ROS run and the package name was beginner tutorials. Okay, so let me go out back to my home directory, or in fact, actually let's uh, go into scripts itself because um, I can show you uh, now the code for, let's look at the server. So add two integers server.python. Okay, so this is the code for the server and let's quickly go over uh, uh, again one line at a time on what is going on. Uh, so first thing you may have noticed is uh, we aren't used to including something called uh, ROS library. So what is ROSLib? ROSLib is kind of the base dependency for uh, for all of you know ROS client library and tools. Basically, it's the it's the library which has all the common tools which help in generating uh, messages and services. It is usually not required that you include ROS library. For the most part, um, if you have imported ROS Python, you don't need to worry about it. But uh, in some cases, when you work with nodes from different ROS packages, uh, you might see that we are uh, explicitly telling ROS that uh, go to the package manifest file for the package beginner tutorials. Remember what the manifest is, it's the package.xml file. And within that file, you know, we have specified what runtime and build uh, dependencies uh, are to be made available for this package. And that's what uh, this is essentially doing. It's, it's uh, making sure all those dependencies of the message generation and the service generation are available. So let's go back to uh, the main part of, of, the, uh, of the code here. And uh, uh, really what is happening is in the main function in our Python, uh, we are calling uh, another function called add to integers uh, underscore server, which is defined right here on line number 11. And this is a very simple uh, function. What it does is it initializes a node. We all know what that means. And the name of the node is add to integers uh, underscore server, right? The same as the name of the file, which is a usually a good idea to be consistent. And then the main thing happens over here on line number 13, where uh, we are declaring a new service, which is called add to integers. So this is the same name which appeared in my ROS service um, list right here, if you remember. So add to integers was what appeared there. And so that's why, you know, this service is being declared here. Uh, and the type of service, which can be thought of as the data structure of the request response for the service. So we covered this during our, during our lecture. Um, this has a specific name called add to ints, right? So it's a specific data structure that we have manually defined. We'll take a quick peek at what this data structure is in, in just a second. And so all service requests are passed onto this handle um, or a callback called handle add to integers. Um, and so let's look at what's going on within this handle. So in, anytime a request arrives from a client, uh, it will be packaged into this uh, uh, request object or data structure. Uh, and handle to integers is called essentially with the 
instances of add to integer requests. So remember how uh, one of the things that the RossPy uh, API and the build process is doing is we give it the type of the service and it creates an object called uh, add to integer request and add to integer response, right? So we never define, for example, what response is explicitly, but we know that Ross will know what this means because we have provided the name of the service or the data structure of the service right here, and it will create both request and response. So this um, request is what is being parsed by the callback function over here. So what this function does is very straightforward. It uh, uh, is looking at two components of the request, so integer A and a field called B. Uh, and we know they are called A and B because it's defined in this service file and that I'll show you uh, after, after we look through this code. And what it's computing is the sum of these two integers and uh, sending that as the response of this uh, service, right? So. Uh, when we say return add to integers response, it's storing the value of the sum that it's computing into the part of the data structure of request, which is dedicated for uh, for handling the, the sum itself. So it returns that uh, uh, the response to the client and uh, to keep this node alive, just like sort of a subscriber, uh, we use rospy.spin so that this node uh, doesn't stop its execution. So I think it will help if I show the actual service file um, sort of uh, uh, side by side. Um, so let me let me open that up first. Um, so if I go into the same package uh, folder, you will see that in addition to scripts, which is mainly where we have been spending most of our time, there is a different subdirectory called SRV, which stands for service. So here we can now go to this subdirectory, and inside that we have a single file called add to integers.srv. So let me quickly show you what this file is. Okay, so you can see this file has this uh, data structure defined, where we have a, uh, let me just make sure this remains on top. So we have this data structure where um, we have the request part of the service defined as two 64-bit integers, uh, which use the, f uh, the notation A and B. So this is the reason why the request object contains these two fields A and B, right? So that's why we know like I can't just use any arbitrary alphabet here. It has to match the definition of the of the .srv file. And this is where the add to int service data structure uh, is being defined. And what Ross is building is uh, two versions of it. It's building a add to integer response, which will go into a field called sum. Um, so if, uh, if the client has to read the response from the server, it will have to use something like request.sum because the name of the field is sum. And then it also uh, creates another um, kind of a, a object which is add to integers request, uh, which will the, the client side of the server uh, will use. All right, so, so not much is going on in terms of the server itself. I hope the definition of the, of the service file uh, clarifies whatever doubts you may have when you look at the code itself. Uh, but other than that, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, the server is always running. Uh, when it gets a request, that request is sent to this handler or this callback function, which computes the sum of the fields which uh, the client will provide as part of this request object, and the server will return the sum uh, as part of the response object. Um, quick note on the, on the service itself. Let me just clear this so things are... are easy to see. Um, so the first thing is that I, instead of just opening the file, I could have just used some ROS file uh, command line tools, right? So some file system tools. Um, I'll, and since we are still in the phase of getting used to these file systems tools, I thought we can uh, take a quick uh, uh, you know, detour to cover some of the ROS service tools. So I could say something like ROS serve or service um, show 
and then the name of the package is beginner tutorials and if i hit tab then ross already knows that within beginner tutorials there's only one srv file which is add to integers so i didn't have to cd to the directory or do anything and if i hit the return key it will already show me the format of the the service type okay so that's the the first thing to uh, uh, to note here that you didn't have to open uh, the the SRV file in a separate um, editor or first change directory. You could have simply looked at the file because this is a very simple data structure. It, you know, will fit nicely in the uh, in the space we have available. So the the service is shown here. This is the one that we have created ourselves in the beginner tutorial uh, package. So that's most of what is happening on the server side, which is still running in the background. We can uh, you know, invoke another uh, request from the server. Uh, but then let's go and look at what's happening on the, on the client side. Um, in fact, instead of opening it up again, I'll just load my uh, IDE over here, which already has the, the client opening. Um, So yeah, so it's, this is the Visual Studio IDE. Um, it's a, another way so that I don't have to open every file in a different editor. So you can already see just just a quick uh, uh, you know overview of what is happening here. I'm in my Catkin workspace right here. Uh, in that we have the source folder, the beginner tutorial package. Inside the beginner tutorial package, uh, we have all the subdirectories, and inside this we have our definition, which we just saw. Uh, and then uh, inside scripts, we have our server that we just saw, and now we will go over the client. All right, so let's look at what's happening on the, on the client side. Uh, so once again, we have our, um, uh, you know, the same import of ROS library uh, where we are up, uh, loading the, uh, the manifest, which is specifying, you can see the benefit of using the IDEs, it prompts uh, and auto-completes when you even use your code or write your code, uh, but that's what this is doing. So we won't go over all of the uh, include functions over here. Um, let's just quickly jump into uh, you know, what is happening in the, uh, in the code itself. So if you look at the main function down below, um, we have a quick check to look at if the user has provided uh, a consistent number of arguments, right? So remember how I intentionally invoked the client um, uh, and didn't provide any two integers to add, and then it uh, echoed this message that you know you need to provide uh, x and y. Uh, so this is that part of the code which is doing that. Uh, if your number of arguments is fine, then it will pick up what is x, it will pick up what is y, and then it will say I'm requesting the sum of x and y. So this is just a prompt to appear on the uh, on the terminal, uh, and then. As it is printing the result, it prints out x, it prints out y, and it calls this function uh, add to integers uh, uh, underscore client and passes the arguments x and y to this function. Right. So this is the main function of our client, uh, and so the interesting stuff is happening over here. So in in this function, it takes the input x and y, which are user um, defined inputs. And then we have a, a command called rospy wait for service and then the name of the service. And so this piece of the code in the client is so that, you know, you, this is basically a method that blocks the execution of the code until the service add to integers has been found and is available. Okay, so the, uh, Underneath the hood, it is going to check with the ROS master whether this service is running or not, and uh, we don't want to uh, proceed further before we can confirm if the service is running or not. Uh, if the service doesn't run or times out, then there will be an exception, uh, service exception, which will be caught, and then the client will say that the service called has failed. Uh, but as long as the service is running, uh, the main thing happens here is uh, we create a handle for uh, for calling the service. So we use a command called uh, rospy.serviceProxy. This is the ROS Python API to uh, uh, invoke a service request. And so this is followed by the name of the service, of course, and uh, the service type or the data structure 
uh, defined in the .srv file that we just saw. So we have created our own handle to this service and then we can just use this handle as a normal function and say that the response I want uh, is pass the correct arguments to this handle. And so we are passing the arguments x and y and again behind the scenes we are issuing a add to integers request with these two values. And so this is what is going to the, the server uh, in form of this request object where the x and y are mapped to the a and b, the sum is computed, and when we say return the add to integers respond from the server, uh, that returns the sum to this uh, object right here, or field right here, and then uh, we can look at the sum by looking at the dot field uh, part of this data structure. So how do we know this is dot sum? Because we just saw that the sum of a and b is going to be stored in the particular field of this service data structure called sum. So that's why uh, we, in order for us to extract that information uh, and return it to uh, this part of our print statement, because here is where the function was called, uh, we are just uh, computing the, uh, we are just reading off the, the sum and returning that value. Right, so because we have uh, essentially, you know, during during all of this, because we have declared the, the type of the service to be add to integers, uh, it is doing the work of generating the add to integers request object for you, right? So you, we can explicitly pass that object as well, but uh, it will create that object. And the return value is the add to integers response object. And this was again covered in a little bit more detail uh, in, the, in the lecture. And if the call fails for any reason, the exception may be thrown so we can uh, set, we, and that's why the, the try and accept block uh, has, been, has been set up. Uh, there is one thing of, to note here. I don't know if you've already caught it, uh, but I would want to draw your attention to this um, attribute of the client. If you notice, this client is missing a very important RossPy API call. Can you guess what I'm alluding to? So look at the code uh, in the client. And for this to be a valid ROS node, it needs a very uh, particular and a simple ROS by method defined somewhere, which is missing altogether from the client. And so for those of you who figured it out, the client code is not calling rospy.init node, the rospy.initialization of the node itself. So if you go back and look at the server, uh, we were calling rospy initialize node with the name of the server. But in the client, we aren't doing any of that. So this is another key difference from the publisher subscriber way of uh, exchanging data, that the client for calling services does not have to use initialize node. It can just be a Python executable as long as you import rospy uh, and you import you know, the, uh, uh, the, the service definition as well. If it's customized, um, all of this should work because ROS knows uh, what this means and we, uh, it will check for you know, the presence of the service with the ROS master. And so therefore this itself is not really a ROS node, it's just literally a Python client, which is interfacing or exchanging data uh, with, uh, with the ROS node. So that is a big, big difference that this is all working and I could still use ROS run uh, to actually launch the client uh, and it still works, but it doesn't need um, its own um, uh, ROS initialization code, right? So just to be sure, um, let me clear this. So we can say, you know, I can call, I can call this as if I am calling a ROS node. ROS run package name, name of the node, and followed by some arguments. But it is not really a, a node in itself, and we can kind of confirm that here as well. If we say ROS node list we actually have just one node running, which is the server, which makes sense because we initialize this as a ROS node uh, in our code itself. So I hope that clarifies how client servers operate. 
you need a server, you need a definition of the service. In this case, it's a customized service. And if the server is running, um, you can pass the correct form of input arguments and it will compute the response back. So, uh, so there is this kind of a you know, back and forth, which is not the case with the publishing and the subscribing model that uh, we previously saw. Uh, final thing I also, also want to show you here is, uh, since we added our own definition of uh, a customized service called add to ints, in the package XML uh, manifest of the beginner tutorials uh, package, uh, we will see that you know we have to comment out uh, some message generation dependencies, both at execution time and at build time. So when we uh, when we un when we comment this out, what this is telling Katkin or, or Ross is that during the build process, you have to create um, these dependencies of the request and the response um, objects for the service. So the add to integers response object and the add to integers request object is created, and it's also going to be used at runtime. And if you look at the CMake list of the package as well, um, there is a part in the CMake file where we show them that in the SRV folder, uh, there's a file called add to integer. So this is how Katkin knows uh, that it, where to look for the files and what is the name of the, of the file where this custom service is also defined, right? So um, sometimes we get too caught up in writing the script and the definitions itself, we forget to include them in the package manifest and the CMake file. So always be mindful if you are creating your own custom stuff, or adding any kind of dependencies or uh, you know custom services that you've copied from some GitHub repo or something like that, uh, we have to point CMake and Katkin to where those things reside for it to work uh, out of the box. Okay, so so that in a nutshell was uh, how services run. So let me uh, exit this and then we will just resume uh, by jumping into launch files. So hopefully by this point, you have realized that, uh, you know, we, we have to start a lot of nodes for even uh, these very, very uh, small demos. Usually it is a few nodes, two or three. Uh, as we go deeper into the F110 stack, uh, we'll have to launch and examine uh, a lot of nodes. And not only that, we have to launch them in a particular order, right? So if some map hasn't been loaded, then there is no point in trying to localize because a map doesn't exist and things like that. So, so launching every node individually is not the best option. It's almost like you need a, a flight pre-flight checklist where you have to launch this, launch that. Uh, and by, by launch, I mean you have to type ROS run, name of the package, name of the node uh, in different shells, um, one at a time. And so it's not the best option, it's not the most efficient way of doing development in ROS. Uh, it not only does it take time, but it can result in a lot of command um, terminals opening up and just uh, you know, populating the entire real estate of your, of your screen. So to remedy this, a very powerful tool that we will use uh, quite a lot, uh, especially when we jump into the simulator, uh, is what is called ROS launch. So ROS launch is a tool in ROS that allows you to start multiple nodes with only one command. And this command works because all of these nodes are defined in what is called um, the launch file. An example of that is what you, what you see here. So uh, this launch file is also already contained in the, in the beginner tutorial package that you must have uh, uh, downloaded from GitHub. And uh, we will go over understanding this um, this uh, XML file. It's an XML format, even though the file is called .launch. And so let's examine this particular file, which is called total mimic uh, .launch, because it's doing something uh, quite interesting. So if we, if we look at what is happening in this uh, launch file, uh, we start the launch file with the launch tag. This is a requirement uh, in ROS1, where the launch file uh, must have these tags, these are sort of XML style schema tags. Uh, and so you open and close a tag uh, to define different uh, parts of this file and how it is interpreted. Uh, so we have the launch tag, uh, every file is identified uh, as a launch file. Then we uh, are 
starting two groups, right? So we have a group tag here and we have actually two groups. Uh, in the and the argument when we start this group tag is this namespace. So NS stands for namespace. And essentially what we are doing is we are naming our first group as turtle sim one, and we are naming our second group as turtle sim two. Uh, and so what is happening in the first group is we define that we want to uh, start a node. So we have the node tag. The node belongs to the package turtle sim. Uh, we can name the node sim or whatever we want. And the, the actual execution of the node uh, or the name of the ROS node is turtle sim underscore node. So remember, we used to say ROS run turtle sim, turtle sim node. Uh, that's essentially what this line of the launch file does. Okay, so so all this is doing is it's launch, it's going to launch an instance of the turtle sim ocean. Then we are also launching an instance of the turtle teleop key node. Uh, and what this argument does is it forces the um, it forces ROS to launch this teleop key node in a different instance of the terminal. Otherwise, everything is going to be launched from the same terminal. You'll see that when we actually use this file. Uh, but that's what this launch prefix does. It's forcing um, the gnome to use a external or a separate terminal instance for the teleop key. Why might you ask we need this? Because remember that teleop key is one where you can move the turtle around with the arrow key. So it just helps if there's a dedicated shell instance for that. So we are launching two nodes, nothing uh, really interesting so far, except that they have been packaged into this group called Total Sim one Then we start another group called Total Sim 2 and inside that group we are launching another Total Sim node. Now here is already where interesting stuff is happening. Remember how earlier I had told you that if a ROS node is already executing and you relaunch that node from another terminal instance, the first instance will stop executing because ROS does not allow two nodes with the same name to be executing at the same time, right? The first one will stop instances. In fact, we saw, I think, a version of this in our uh, talker and listener example where we tried to launch multiple talkers. And we also spent some time looking at uh, the anonymous true and anonymous fall uh, argument of the ROS pi uh, dot init underscore node. However, the difference here is even though we are launching the exact, we are running the exact same node twice, they have been assigned two different namespaces. So one of our turtle sim oceans is going to be called turtle sim one or associated with this namespace and the other will be associated with a different namespace. So that's how ROS will be able to distinguish between two instances of the same node and then both of them can run at the same time. So that's already you know some kind of a, a, a commentary on why you might need to define groups because groups can be separated by assigning namespaces to them. So this allows us essentially to start two turtle sim simulators without having any name conflicts, right? That's the take home message. And finally, we also start a node called the mimic node. This is present uh, in the turtle sim uh, simulator. We didn't have to write any of our own stuff. And what the mimic node does is it's, it's mapping the topics uh, and the input and the output uh, between turtle sim one and turtle sim two, right? So uh, we have this um, tag called remap, where we are essentially saying is that we want turtle sim two to mimic the inputs that are given to turtle sim one, right? So remap from inputs to turtle sim one as the output to turtle sim two, and again this will become more clear as we launch uh, this launch file. Um, so, so don't get unnecessarily confused because we haven't gone into looking at the code of the, the Mimic uh, node itself. Uh, the point of this exercise is to not get into you know this Mimic process and why it works. The point is to show you that we have created a launch file which is launching one, two, three, and four nodes in a single file. 
So this is how launch files are intended to be used. And in, in understanding this launch file, we uh, try to understand also uh, a little bit in terms of uh, what these different tags do. How do you launch a node? How do you assign a group? What is a namespace? How do you launch in a separate terminal instance and things like that? So enough, enough talk, let's actually see how it works. So this time I will open just a single window because I will not be launching multiple nodes. In fact, here is the beauty of the launch file. You don't even need to start Roscoe, right? So there is no Roscoe running in my system right now. Uh, all I can just say is ROS launch beginner tutorials and the name of this file is total mimic.launch. So let's hit the return key and you see a bunch of stuff has already happened. We have two total sim nodes. So let's make them always visible. Then here is our teleop key node, which was launched um, separately in its own window as requested. And then everything got launched in a single terminal session, right? So you can go and scroll and look at the, the files, um, look at the echo commands, and you can see it start, it's auto starting the ROS master as well. And then it's starting all these processes as well. So this is pretty neat because it shows you the power of uh, uh, writing uh, these launch scripts, which can launch a bunch of different stuff in sequence, uh, saving you a lot of window space and a lot of clutter, and also making the, the process of doing ROS development very, very fast. Um, so just to now show you what this mimic stuff was all about, what I'm going to do is I'm going to interact with the teleop screen by pressing some arrow keys. And what you see is both turtles are mimicking the actions. Whereas, you know, we have been used to just controlling one turtle in the ocean. Uh, trying to draw a figure eight. Very horrible, but kind of looks like a figure eight. So, so this is what um, turtle mimic or the mimic node was doing, which we also defined uh, in the in the launch file itself, right, right, right here, the lines. 12 to 15, mapping the remapping these inputs and outputs. So this is pretty cool, uh, and it shows um, you know how the two turtle sim start in their own ocean, but uh, they can be controlled using a, a single node. Uh, in fact, we can take this a step further. Um, we could have done this in the launch file itself, but um, let's go and open a new terminal where we'll try to now make um, these turtles uh, uh, drive around or swim around in a, in a circle. So remember, uh, it seems like a while ago, but we had done this uh, ROS topic publish command, where we want to publish at the rate of one hertz on the topic uh, total sim one, um, total one and we want to publish on the command velocity. It will have a message type geometry message twist. And if you remember, we had um, done something like uh, move linearly with a velocity of two and start rotating around the Z axis uh, with a velocity of, I think we always choose 1.8. So if we run this, you see both turtles are now moving in a circle. And so this is just, we, we already expected that, but this is another way to look at uh, what Turtle Mimic is doing. So again, Turtle Mimic was not the point of this exercise. The point is to understand uh, launch files. So maybe let's look at the RQT graph and see how things are related. So I can say ROS run, um, RQT graph and RQT graph. So a lot is going on. Let's try to wrap our heads around um, you know this RQT graph. First, we see uh, we have this namespace called Total Sim One. So see how we have the namespace defined as its own uh, kind of a block in the RQT uh, uh, graph. Inside Turtle Sim 1, we have the teleop node and the Turtle Sim 1 
simulator, which is exactly how we defined it in our launch file. These two nodes were included in the namespace uh, one object. Let me zoom in here to make sure uh, it's clear what I'm talking about, right? So, so these two nodes, total sim one slash sim and total sim one slash teleop total, they were defined as part of this namespace. We already know that the teleop is going to um, you know, send command velocities to total sim one as part of this namespace. In fact, this is our teleop um, node publishing on command velocity, and this is the uh, the circle that we are just creating. It's created in a, a node on the fly uh, in terms of this ROS topic publish issue, and so this ROS topic publish has created its uh, its own node, which uh, is this uh, in a pseudo random sequence. And it's also publishing to command velocity, making the total sim one node go around in these circles. But we have a mimic node running, which is taking the input from the pose of the first turtle and mimicking that into the command velocity of the second turtle. So that's what this remap stuff was doing in the launch file. It's taking the pose of the first and mimicking it into the command velocity of the second turtle. And the second turtle has its own namespace called total sim two, which is why both the two oceans are running at the same time, even though it is the same piece of code which is uh, enabling the two simulators to run. But we have only differentiated them in their, in their namespace itself. So on its own, total sim two has no uh, dedicated input for command velocity. It's borrowing the inputs in terms of reading the pose of the first turtle and using that as uh, commands to its own pose or its own uh, command velocity. So pretty pretty interesting stuff on how turtle sim work, or not sorry, how ROS launch can uh, set up these interesting simulations very, very fast. Um, it, it kind of defeats the purpose. I said that would be very less cluttered, but the clutter right now is not because of ROS launch is because I have uh, opened up a lot of windows to diagnose and run these other nodes uh, as well. I could have actually written a launch file which opens all of these in the single launch file. So it opens the uh, the teleop uh, and it opens the uh, the ROS topic publisher as well um, and the RQT graph in the same uh, launch file. So that would have been um, probably a better way to show the effectiveness of launch file, but I hope you get the idea uh, and you will be required to build such launch files for um, your submission of your assignments in the future. In fact, very rarely we will ask you to you know, run uh, one node at a time. Uh, your submissions will be in form of your entire package and uh, we will only execute the launch files that we will require you to add to your package uh, when you respond to the assignments. Speaking of which, the first assignment is going to be released this week. It will be announced on Colab and Piazza, and a video will be released to walk you through what exactly has to be done in that assignment. Uh, all you have to do is really write some nodes that will autonomously control uh, a turtle in the ocean. So if we can autonomously make our turtle swim, we can make a, a car drive as well. Um, so with that, I will come to the close of this lecture. The last thing I want to just quickly talk about is, uh, for your reference, I've included another example of a simpler launch file, which is simply um, launching um, a bunch of different talkers and listeners. So uh, remember how we spoke about launching different instances of talker and both of them publishing to the single listener. We also saw this, I believe, as one of the examples in the previous lab sessions. Uh, so here's even a simpler file, which doesn't have a lot of groups, but also just launching different uh, nodes in the same name. When you don't have groups, you can uh, use the name field for uh, as the input to the namespace. So you can see here, we are launching two instances of talker.python, uh, but we are renaming the first one to be talker1, the second to be talker2. So um, you can also just launch this file and see how the two talkers and the listener will work in the same manner as in the uh, end of the previous lab session. So uh, that is all I wanted to really cover in the services and launch files today. So we can stop here and you can expect the next video to talk about the first um, autonomous total assignment that you have to 
submit because we have covered enough to uh, attempt that assignment. The only thing which I believe uh, remains is uh, to give you guys a little bit of an overview of RWIS and what are uh, bag files, and we will cover that in a subsequent lecture. So, yeah, let's end the video here, and I'll see you next time.